everyone. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Professor Jonathan Gil Harris today. Professor Harris was born in New Zealand and educated in England. He lived in the US for 23 years and was professor of English at George Washington University and associate editor of Shakespeare Quarterly, the world's leading journal on Shakespeare stu studies. He's the author of six books on Shakespeare, including Shakespeare and Literary Theory and The Untimely, Mat Untimely Matter in the Time of Shakespeare. In recent years, Professor Harris's scholarship has turned to Indian themes. He's the editor of a collection of essays, Indography, writing the Indian and early modern culture, and has written two series for the Hindustan Times on India Bana Pardes and Tales of the First Firangis. His most recent book, The First Firangis, How to Be Authentically Indian, was published by Aleph Book. Professor Harris, after visiting India recently, regularly for the last 15 years, sorry, became a permanent resident last June. He now lives in Delhi and is Professor of English and, de and Dean of Academic Affairs at Ashoka University. May I please invite Professor Harris on stage? And, uh, uh, we'll have the last few minutes uh, for question and answers, but till then, the stage is yours, sir. Thank you. Today is the day in which New Zealand does a stealth takeover of Chennai. Here we are. <laughs> um, so, this is in some ways a shameless plug for my book, The First Ferengis. It's now subtitled Remarkable Stories of Heroes, Healers, Charlatans and Courtesans and Other Foreigners Who Became Indian. Uh, you can see in the picture there uh, four Ferengis four white men, uh, Portuguese in origin. Uh, they're not painted in Goa. Uh, these are men who are living in Mughal Hindustan. Uh, it's very hard for us now to imagine that uh, Westerners who lived in India before independence were anything other than the agents of conquest, imperialism, colonialism. Uh, and I think that says a lot about how the specter of the British Raj still casts a long shadow over India now. Uh, but in fact, there were many people who lived in India uh, of European origin from other parts of the world as well, uh, who didn't come here to conquer and command, but who came here for more humble reasons, basically to escape poverty and persecution. Some of these people were economic refugees, some of them were criminals. Some of them were religious refugees, and some were what we might call sexual dissidents. Uh, but they'd all come to India not in the hope of acquiring power or massive wealth, but they were, for whatever reason, looking for a better life than the one they'd left in their former home. Now, I think what also challenges our way of thinking about Westerners in India before independence uh, is the fact that uh, if you go back to the 16th and 17th centuries, Europe was not the most powerful force on the planet. Uh, the most powerful nations were, in fact, Asian empires. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Safavid uh, Persian Empire and the Mughal Empire. It's partly because of the glamour of uh, the power of these empires that uh, foreigners who were coming from very poor and humble backgrounds made their way uh, to, to India. Now, these foreigners came for a variety of reasons, as I've suggested. Uh, some of them didn't come of their own choice. Some were forced here uh, because they came as slaves. It goes very much against the grain of uh, what we think now about slavery. Uh, but uh, many white people served Indian masters, not just as indentured servants, but as slaves. Many women came, well, not many women, but a number of women came here, not out of their choice, but because uh, they were the servants of male masters. Uh, and I'll be talking about some of those women uh, soon. But this is the part that interests me. After coming to India, these migrants became Indian. They ate Indian food, they wore Indian clothes. In some cases, they converted to Indian religions. They practiced Indian rituals. They acquired Indian knowledges. 
they fell in love with Indians. In some cases, they had Indian children. Now, what does it mean to become Indian before the time of the British Raj? It's certainly not to become one monolithic thing. To become Indian depends a great deal on one's environmental as well as cultural and economic location. To become Indian uh, in the coconut-rich hinterland of uh, the Konkan coast is a very different proposition from becoming Indian uh, in the typhoon-drenched, mosquito-infested terrain of the Sundarbans. Uh, to become Indian in the arid highlands of the Deccans is something very different from becoming Indian in the fakir, congested gullies of Ajmer or in the luxurious havelis of Agra and Lahore. Um, <clears throat> so, the one thing that all these locations have in common is that they were far more multicultural spaces uh, than we've been inclined to believe. So the Konkan coast, for instance, uh, was a refuge for many religious dissidents from Europe. A surprising number of Jews made their way to the Konkan coast in the 16th century, in particular after the watershed years of 1492, uh, when the Spanish Inquisition was set up after the eviction of Muslims and Jews from uh, the Iberian Peninsula. And then again in 1534, when Portugal, which had been previously an independent state, uh, then was absorbed into the Kingdom of Spain, set up its, no, its own Inquisition. And a large number of Jews escaped to the Konkan coast, uh, where they were accompanied by religious dissidents from other parts of Europe too. Uh, Catholics from uh, the Protestant northern nations, a surprising number found their way uh, to, to the west coast of India. The Sundarbans uh, is a particularly interesting and stateless zone. In the 16th and 17th centuries, it was uh, the site of uh, repeated uh, power grabs between various uh, political forces, uh, the, the Mughals, the Arakanese, um, the Portuguese. Uh, but uh, the Delta area became a hideout for pirate communities that were astonishingly multicultural. Uh, some of these pirate communities included not just Bengalis and Burmese, but also uh, renegade Portuguese. Uh, the Deccan Sultanates were ruled by Persian and Turkish elites, but they welcomed a huge number of immigrants from various parts of the world, including Europe, but also Africa. Uh, their armies consisted, uh, to a large extent, of uh, slaves who had been captured in, and captured in Africa and brought over. They were known as cities, but also hubshis, uh, the uh, Deccani word for Ethiopian. Uh, this here is uh, Malik Ambar, a figure that uh, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, he was an Ethiopian slave uh, who came to uh, Hyderabad in about uh, 1580, uh, but he rose to become the Vakil or Sultanat of uh, Ahmednagar. Uh, and then we have the extraordinarily multicultural spaces of the Mughal cities. Uh, Agra, Lahore, Ajmer, Delhi, but also Fatapur Sikri. To a visitor coming to Fatapur Sikri before it was evacuated owing to drought uh, in the uh, mid 1580s, uh, the city would have looked at least at first glance like a typical Muslim city. Um, and even the Bulan Darwaza, the, the big doorway that greeted people when uh, they had to enter the city. Uh, would have seemed like a conventional uh, piece of Muslim architecture. But inscribed on the doorway in Nastalik script um, is a slogan that has sometimes been called a Quranic quote. But in fact, it cites Jesus. Um, it's a remark about uh, the transience of uh, all existence uh, that uh, this world is a bridge. It's best not to build one's house on it. Um, Extraordinary foresight on the part of the builders of Fatapur Sikri, perhaps, given that they had to evacuate it just a few years after they'd put this inscription on the Bulan Darwaza. Uh, but this is a sign of the extent to which Akbar, uh, the emperor who, uh, whose capital it was, 
uh, was not only interested in other cultures, other religions, but had invited people from other parts of the world to come and live in Fatapur Sikri. And we'll talk about some of these people soon. Now, each of these different multicultural spaces offered foreign migrants, many of them Europeans, new homes. Uh, but they also asked of the migrants that they transform their bodily skills and their habits, which is to say, these spaces were what we might call engines of bodily transformation. The foreigners who settled in them had to transform their bodies in a variety of ways, uh, not only by eating Indian food, uh, by weathering extreme weather conditions that uh, were, were foreign to them, uh, by acquiring Indian illnesses that uh, made them very sick but also radically transformed their immune systems. Uh, but there were all sorts of other ways, too, in which uh, these migrants had to transform their bodies. And uh, this is one of the things that interests me most about uh, the experiences of these migrants. This is a very literal interpretation of what it means to do biography. Uh, biography is something that we normally associate just with the chronological sequence of events in a person's life, perhaps within the larger cultural, social, uh, political context. But biography literally means, um, it comes from the Greek, inscription of the body. Graphene means to write or to inscribe, bios meaning life or body. Uh, all these migrants performed biographies in this most literal sense in as much as their bodies were inscribed by their new environments in ways that forced them to become very different people, that forced them to become Indian. So, just to give you some examples, a huge number of foreigners, Europeans, made their way into the armies of the Mughal Empire and the Deccan uh, Sultanates. Uh, they formed the ranks of uh, what were called the Farangiyang, uh, renegade, in many cases, converts to Islam, uh, who were still marked as foreigners, as you can tell from the name Farangiyang. Uh, but uh, their skills were coveted because they were supposed to have some knowledge of uh, firearms, how to handle artillery. Uh, but in turn, they also had to acquire all these new bodily skills. They, uh, often knew how to ride horses, but they had to ride them in very different conditions and very different terrain. Riding horses over the highlands of the Deccan was a very different proposition from riding a horse, say, uh, in a meadow in England. Uh, they had to wear very different clothes to protect against the heat. And uh, they also had to wear very different, uh, or they had to use very different kinds of weapons. Uh, they had to get used to very different types of military maneuver. Uh, warrior sailors, there are quite a few of them, because of the caste prescriptions against uh, uh, crossing the sea. Uh, Hindu uh, kings, rajas, often found it hard to staff their ships uh, with, with warrior sailors. So they recruited uh, foreigners uh, who, again, had to acquire new skills on board the boats where they served often wielding new weapons, scimitars and machetes. These are weapons from uh, the museum uh, that commemorates the Kunyali Marakars uh, from Kerala, uh, from near Korikod, Calicut. Uh, the Kunyali Marakars were themselves descended from foreign migrants, uh, Arabs, uh, but they employed uh, a number of sailors from different parts of the world, uh, including a Chinese migrant who had been a Portuguese slave in Malacca, who was known as a Farangi, uh, because uh, he had served a Christian master, uh, but who converted to Islam upon coming to India and became the scourge of the Portuguese uh, from 1596 to 1600 before being captured, reconverted to Christianity and executed by the Portuguese. Uh, then there are the foreigners who joined itinerant religious communities. And these were not quite the counterparts of modern-day hippies who joined ashrams. They're, they're very different people uh, because uh, they were less curiosity seekers than they were very poor people who fell in with groups of itinerant religious beggars in order to feed themselves. Now, one such figure is Thomas Coriat, 
who is depicted here on the cover of uh, an account of his uh, visit to Ajmer. Uh, he's depicted here wearing English clothes while riding an elephant, but Thomas Coriat would have looked nothing like this while he was living in Ajmer, uh, because he arrived absolutely bankrupt uh, and had to beg for a living for quite some time. Uh, he closely watched the activities of the fakirs in the gullies of Ajmer. Uh, and in the process, his body had to change. He wasn't wearing many clothes. He had to endure extremes of heat. And he also had to get used to a radically new diet of dal chavel, kichiri, in other words. And he actually writes about the experience of feeding uh, on kichiri that had been prepared by Jahangir uh, in one of the digs in the Darga Sharif, the, uh, the Darga there of, of Moinuddin Chishti. Uh, so Koyat's body was radically transformed by his experience of being a begging fakir in Ajmer. And then we have the experiences of some women uh, who may have had it slightly better than Koryat. They didn't have to beg uh, but their lives were not entirely uh, theirs to take control of. Uh, the Armenian migrant Bibi Juliana Farangi uh, lived in the uh, harem of uh, Lahore uh, under the reign of uh, Jahangir. Uh, but she led a very, very constricted life in which she was expected to do many of the menial tasks that lower harem women uh, had to do. Uh, she had to learn how to dance, she had to learn uh, how to comport her body in certain ways, uh, not only according to the rituals of the time, but also according to the clothes that she was forced to wear, uh, a sisful, uh, very heavy headgear. Uh, and uh, this is another woman who lived in the uh, harem of uh, Shah Alam uh, some 100 years later. Coincidentally, her name is also Juliana, or rather Julena, as she was known. Uh, this is Julena Dias da Costa, a Portuguese slave girl who, as far as I've been able to work out, was the child of a Portuguese man from Hooghly. And after Shah Jahan uh, uh, captured Hooghly, he imprisoned many of the Portuguese and uh, Ju uh, Juliana Dias da Costa's uh, father was one of these uh, imprisoned people. She grew up in captivity, uh, but she grew up to be Shah Alam's principal political advisor. Uh, and as you can tell from this portrait here, she certainly didn't have the, the straightened life that uh, her namesake had had 100 years earlier. Uh, this is something of a fanciful portrait, uh, but it is interesting that she's depicted in an outdoor scene uh, uncovered, that she didn't wear a veil here. Uh, she's wearing a mixture of uh, Portuguese and Indian clothes. She's wearing something that looks a little bit uh, like uh, a jama, uh, but it's been given a European-type cowl that, does, uh, that uh, reveals quite uh, explicitly a great big crucifix around her neck. And uh, even though her native language was Persian, and she was much more at home in Indian languages, uh, she was a committed Christian uh, all her life. These migrants were foreign, obviously, but they were also not foreign. And it's interesting the extent to which they were embraced by local Indians as Indian. Yet they still could never quite lose the trace, sometimes even the taint, of having come from elsewhere. They were often called Farangis, a term that we're familiar with now, largely as a term of abuse for white colonists. Uh, but the word Farangi in the, the Mughal period was a very different term from what it became uh, in the age of colonialism. It derives, of course, from elsewhere, from the Arabic Ferengi. Uh, and Ferengi derives from the word Frank. Uh, this is, uh, if you like, a hangover from the age of the Crusades, when a large number of the Crusaders who came to the Middle East were of French origin. Uh, but Ferengi became, in Arabic, a term for anyone who came from a Christian land. It migrated through Persian into India, 
uh, and it has made its way into a variety of Indian languages, including, of course, uh, modern Hindi and Urdu, but also Tamil, the word Parangi. Uh, Parangi, Parangi Malay, St. Thomas Mount, so I'll come back to that soon. Uh, but the word Farangi was used in the Mughal time not just to refer to white people, not just to refer to Christians. It referred to people from a variety of locations, from Europe, but also foreigners who had migrated from Armenia and Georgia, regarded as Farangi Christian countries. It was even occasionally used of people from Africa. Uh, Ethiopia was, of course, a Christian kingdom. And uh, some of the Ethiopians who were referred to as Habshis and Sidis also get the epithet Farangi. Uh, it's occasionally used to people of Muslim origin, uh, which is completely counterintuitive. Uh, for instance, uh, an African slave of a Portuguese colonist who escaped uh, found service with the, the Gujarati uh, Sultan and he was renamed Farangi Khan. Uh, and Farangi Khan is one of the names that we find quite commonly in the records of sultanates from all over India. Yet many of these people were not Christians at any point in their life. Uh, Farangi seems to be a gloriously indeterminate word in terms of what it can refer to, and that's one of the reasons I like it. I think in many ways, the word Farangi refers to something not unlike the history of the word Farangi itself. Something that started off elsewhere, has migrated to India, has become part of India, yet is still marked as foreign in some way. So Farangis, I'm arguing, are people who had a very ambivalent, bifurcated status. They'd become Indian, yet they continued to be marked as foreign. And this ambivalent status was often very difficult uh, for the Farangis to deal with. Yet it was also at times a stimulus to extraordinarily creative experiments, thought experiments, practical experiments. And here's a short list of them. So the Russian slave turned admiral of the Gujarati Sultan, Malik Ayaz. Uh, he arrived in Gujarat in the 1480s, the 1490s, and served uh, uh, Sultan Mehmud uh, Bargana as his slave and was promoted eventually to the rank of admiral. He devised these extraordinary fortifications for Dew uh, that walled off the harbor, that put a chain across it and stopped ships, particularly Portuguese ships. The Portuguese were interested in Dew for a very long time before they finally took possession of it. But it's ironic that the major strategist against Portuguese uh, aggression in Dew was himself a Farangi. Another example. The Portuguese physician Garcia da Horta migrated to Goa in 1534. Uh, for the longest time, he was regarded as a Portuguese patriot and hero. His name appears here with his image on a Portuguese 200 escudo coin, as the exemplar of a Portuguese hero. He was a physician, but he came in 1534 not because he was a dutiful Portuguese patriot, but because he was a very frightened person whose real name was Abraham ben Itzak. He was an undercover Jew. And he came as a physician hoping to escape the Inquisition in Portugal in 1534. And by and large, he was successful. Uh, he practiced in Goa, but then there was talk about introducing the Inquisition in Goa, and he fled to Ahmednagar, where he served the Sultan for many years as his personal physician. And he wrote an extraordinary book about tropical medicine. It's arguably the first book on tropical medicine that draws a great deal on Arabic learning, Arabic learning with which he was familiar as a physician trained in Judeo-Muslim law in Spain and Portugal, uh, but also with the advice of local hakims. Uh, so Garcia de Orta, Abraham ben Itzak became a desi hakim, 
serving the Sultan of Ahmednagar. There were also in the ateliers of uh, the Mughal emperors, painters who came from other parts of the world. Akbar had long been interested in paintings from, uh, from Europe, uh, but he encouraged people to paint in the European style, uh, all the while grafting European techniques to Mughal conventions. Here's an example. This is a painting by uh, someone who has the great name Bichitra, <laughs> unusual. Uh, and it is an unusual painting. Uh, this is uh, Jahangir uh, turning to a Sufi sheikh and refusing the entreaties of great men from, the other part, from other parts of the world, including an Ottoman sultan and, weirdly enough, second from the bottom of those four figures, King James of England and Scotland. Uh, what's most interesting about this painting is that King James has been painted, or rather copied, from a painting that had made its way to India. And uh, the painter, Bichitra, has painted himself at the very bottom. There he is holding a portrait, uh, almost in a sly wink to the audience to say, yes, I made all of this, uh, including this painting of a painting of King James that I've done here. But this is typical of the extent to which uh, the Mughals were interested in engaging European Farangi traditions of art to the point where uh, Jahangir included in his atelier uh, someone who went by the name of Mandu Farangi. We don't know where he originally came from, but he was one of about 150 painters who worked on an extraordinary project, uh, an attempt to illustrate uh, the, uh, uh, the Ramayana, uh, and it was translated into Persian as well. Uh, but this Mandu Farangi uh, attached his name to a couple of paintings in the sequence that depict Ram and Sita and Lakshman. Interestingly, they all have blonde hair. <laughs> uh, another Farangi uh, who came up with an extraordinary thought experiment. He went by the name of Hunarmand, uh, meaning skillful in Persian and Urdu. His real name was Augustin Iriar. He was a scoundrel and a rogue who had escaped France and England because he was a counterfeiter. Uh, but counterfeiters are also very good at producing things uh, that look extraordinary out of seemingly nothing. And uh, he came to uh, the Mughal court, he requested service, he got it, and he was drafted to produce a variety of extraordinary contraptions, including thrones. Uh, it's quite possible that he was responsible for the legendary Tak de Tabus, the peacock throne. Uh, he describes it in one of his letters. Um, Something else he produced, I wish we still had it because it sounds absolutely unbelievable, a remote control device to tame wild elephants when they go rogue after stamping the emperor's enemies to death. It would be useful to have one of those now. Uh, I'm going to finish with uh, two sort of slightly more extended stories. Uh, one of them is about a Farangi named Patri Guru, uh, who wrote... This text, the Pelam Purana, uh, he also wrote another one, the Dusri Purana, Dusra Purana. Uh, but uh, Patri Guru lived most of his life in Rachol, which is now in Goa, but in those days it was sort of right at the threshold between Karnataka and Maharashtra. Uh, before coming to Rachol, he lived in the town of Goa, where he was known as Thomas Estefan. Uh, which would make you think that he was Portuguese, except he wasn't. He was born Thomas Stevens. He was a Catholic dissident who escaped to India in 1579 at the height of persecution of Catholics. Now, there's one document that survives in English that he wrote after he got to India. After arriving, he became a typical Farangi. He fell sick. Uh, with the Goan equivalent of Delhi Belly. He got terribly sick. And so the one thing he writes in a letter back to his father that he likes about India, there's this amazing substance here. Coconut water. Narial Pani. It saved him, he says. And he became, for the rest of his life, an evangelist for the Narial, the coconut. Uh, 
In a letter he wrote in Latin to his brother several years later, this is just about the only other document that survives, he says, I just can't get over this coconut. It's an extraordinary thing. You can do all sorts of amazing feats with it. It gives oil, liquor, toddy, syrup, sugar, and vinegar. You can make coir rope from it. Its branches are used to protect huts from the rain. The fruit contains water that you can drink. Uh, not just water, but it can be fermented. It can become toddy and beer. The shell furnishes the blacksmith with, sh with charcoal. Those who live near the sea can utilize it for sail making. And interestingly, you can use it to write on. It's highly likely that Patri Guru wrote his Patri, his leaves, on actual leaves, coconut leaves, when he wrote his Pelam Purana. Now, it was not just the coconuts that he loved feeling in his mouth. It was also the language of Marathi. And he wrote to his brother that this is the most extraordinary language he's come across. Uh, he said, its pronunciation is not disagreeable. They loved these negative constructions in those days. It's not disagreeable. The phrases and constructions are of a wonderful kind. And then he goes on to say, the Marathi vowels are like liquids. You can swirl them in your mouth. And the extent to which his love of Marathi uh, was connected to his love of coconuts becomes evident in this amazing text he wrote, the Pelam Purana, which is based on the old Puranas, the old Hindu Puranas. Uh, so he wrote at the beginning of uh, what he called the Krista Purana, the Purana of Christ. The weird thing is Christ is not the Christ that you would recognize, that any of us would recognize. He becomes a Swami uh, in the story. Um, the flood is something that uh, uh, is nothing to do with saving mankind uh, from God's vengeance or God's uh, anger, but is simply about uh, the animals that you find in Goa. Uh, in any case, I, I'm not going to read the Marathi out for you, but these are amongst the first few stanzas of the Purana. He talks about Marathi as a transformative language. The mogra among flowers, musk among perfumes, so among languages is the beauty of Marathi. Among birds, the peacock, among trees, the kalpataru, so among languages is Marathi. Now what interests me here is the word kalpataru. He's taken that from Hindu mythology. Um, the kalpataru is, of course, the tree that grants all wishes that Indra takes with him to, to paradise. In various parts of India, the Kalpataru is associated with different trees. In uh, Bengal, uh, it is associated, or Bihar, with the Banyan tree uh, and the Bodhi tree. But Goa, it's the coconut tree. Uh, so this isn't Thomas Stevens, but we can almost imagine <laughs> Patri Guru, <laughs> this is a toddy tapper in Goa, scuffling up trees. Uh, coconut trees to find everything that he needed uh, to, to burn, to feed on, but also to write on. Uh, people have often translated Patri Guru as meaning the teacher who was a father, keeping in mind that he was writing the story of Christ, the Krista Purana. But I'm convinced that Patri Guru is a pun that is designed to pick up on the fact that he was an evangelist for the coconut the patri being the leaf of the coconut tree on which he wrote his Purana. The other Farangi that I want to wrap up with is one much closer to home here in Chennai, uh, who went so often by the name of Hakim Nikilu. He was interestingly a Siddha Vedya practitioner at Paranji Malai near Chennai, where he died in 1720 after living there, it says 24, it's in fact 34 years. He came in 1686. Uh, before that, he'd worked for 30 years as an artillery man in Delhi and Lahore, and had also worked for the future Mughal Emperor Shah Alam, just like uh, Juliana Diaz de Costa. Uh, but he was originally a teenaged runaway from Venice, the son of a road sweeper. So he arrived in India extraordinarily poor. It was a shock to his system. He had to deal in particular with heat of an order that he'd never encountered in Venice. And he learned very early on that he needed to adapt his body, just as Patri Guru had adapted his body, thanks to Nari Alpani, Elanira. Um, but here, Hakim Nicolo adapted his body uh, through clothing and food. Uh, he took to wearing the kaaba, 
which he found was an extraordinary way of keeping his body hydrated. This may seem very counterintuitive to us now, but the whole point of the kaaba was to trap moisture inside the clothing to make sure that the body was constantly in contact with water, that the body fluids didn't evaporate altogether. He wore it for the rest of his life along with a pagri. But he also found that certain types of Indian food uh, were vital for him to be able to survive the weather and in ways that challenged his understanding of what was required for health in Europe. Eating hot, spicy food, he realized, was very important for dealing with the heat. In Europe, traditionally, one dealt with the heat by eating cold substances. This was part of an allopathic view of the universe, that you drove out the heat with cold. But Hakim Nicolo found very early on that heat was the best way to deal with heat. If you can't stand the heat, stay in the kitchen, at least if there's masala in it. He also became uh, a big consumer of pan. <laughs> he fainted the first time he took it. He fainted the next few times he took it. But he kept on taking it because he said the heat of the pan was necessary for him uh, to endure the heat of India. He became very interested in what you have to put in your body to survive, and as a result, this led him to herbal medicine. Uh, and he became quite a student of local Indian practices of healing involving plants, and it was on Paranji Malai, there we have a modern-day Paranji, uh, John Paul, uh, who visited the top of St. Thomas Mount some years ago, is commemorated with this extraordinary mannequin. But this is where, uh, this is where Hakim Nicolo lived for a long time, growing plants for his medical practice. But it wasn't just plants he used. He was interested in all sorts of other substances, some of them rather strange and uh, disconcerting. Uh, he believed that human fat was necessary to get rid of certain illnesses, and this resulted in him acquiring a, a rather scary reputation as something of a vampire figure. He was always going to executions, particularly of very large people, and requesting that their bodies be drained of fat so he could use them for his capsules. Um, and he made something that was known as a manuch stone, <laughs> that uh, he uh, used human fat uh, as, as, as a medical substance. For. But uh, what he used most of all and what established his fame uh, in Paranji Malai was lingam. Um, and I'm speaking here not about the body part, but about the chemical substance, uh, mercury sulfide, uh, which he prescribed with a great deal of success uh, for people suffering from impotence. Uh, now, this was very much in accordance with Siddha uh, Vaidya uh, law. And he seems to have studied, perhaps not with uh, due diligence, but with a certain amount of uh, uh, sincerity, uh, Siddha learning. And it was as a Siddha Vedya that he became uh, reputed. There he is. This is a picture that he himself had requisitioned of himself carrying a plant in Mughal style, um, but in the garb of a physician. So... Just to wrap up, even as they transformed their bodies, each of these migrants also helped transform what we mean by India. They made India something more complex and plural than we might regard it as being a lot of the time. These migrants, these Farangis, are a reminder that India has always been multicultural and that the presence of Farangis in India is as Indian a tradition as anything else. Let's not forget that Ashoka, the Indian who unified the subcontinent two and a half thousand years ago, himself had a Persian Greek step-grandmother, and that when he came to inscribe the pillars, at least in the north, he inscribed them not only in Prakrit, the language that is the ancestor of Sanskrit and Pali, but also in Aramaic and in Greek. India has always been Farangi. Farangis have always been Indian. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor Harris. Uh, we have, I think, a little time left for some questions. So uh, do we have any hands up for any questions? Uh, you, uh, I thought I heard you mention that there were not enough uh, warrior sailors because of a caste 
uh, some sort of cost reason. Could you yeah. amplify on that one? Uh, so it was often very hard, uh, partly because of the cost prescription about uh, the, the kalapani. <laughs> Um, there, there was a great deal of anxiety on the part of many people about simply sailing on the sea. And to recruit the kind of large armies, uh, sea armies and navies that were needed to defend uh, certain parts of India at a time of great aggression, in particular from the Portuguese, uh, uh, various local leaders, including the Maharaja Travancore, uh, deliberately included in... Um, uh, amongst his armies are uh, people from other parts of the world. So, for instance, uh, the Dutch commander, uh, Eustatius de Lannoy, uh, who'd been sent by the, the Dutch uh, East India Company uh, to explore the possibility of uh, an aggressive invasion of the, south, uh, the southern tip of India uh, to help the Dutch secure a foothold in the spice trade. He was defeated at the Battle of Colonel and uh, the Maharaja Travancore made him an offer, saying, if you join me, I will give you all the riches you need, um, but I want you to reform my army and my navy according to Dutch lines. Not only did Eustatius de Lannoy agree, he in effect became Indian. He assumed the name de Lanai. His tomb, which is in Udiagiri near Kanyakumari, um, includes Tamil inscriptions. Um, Several of his uh, Dutch uh, crewmen also joined. They also became uh, Tamil or Travancore uh, patriots. Uh, so, and this is not an isolated incident. Uh, the same thing happened in Gujarat, for instance, where a lot of the, uh, the people who were responsible for defending Dew and the other ports against Portuguese invasion uh, were from other parts of the world. Uh, it wasn't because they already had naval experience. Uh, it was because uh, they, they, in some cases, they had sailed in order to get to India, uh, but they had less anxiety about being on the sea than uh, some of the local people had. Um, I'm so sorry about this, but I think we've got the, it's a wrap board, so I will have mm -hmm. to end the question and answers here, but uh, uh, Mr. Harris will be outside in case... Uh, anyone wants to ask any more questions, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you.